Okay, so uh, this is Dr. Morton, and this is the lecture for Monday, the uh, the second of November. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so we're going to cover Unit Twelve. So we we did the test last week. Uh, I'm not going to go over the test probably till Wednesday. Um, uh, in case there's some that haven't taken it, I don't know. We'll see. There, there's a few. We'll sort that out, hopefully. Um, and then, um, or I may go over it on Friday. We'll see. In any event, I'm going to cover Unit 12 today. Uh, so let's look at the syllabus real quick. So, so this is week 11, which is really amazing. So here we are in November. We really just have 11, 12, 13, 14. Four more weeks. That's it. Done. Semester over. So we're moving right along, and uh, we will. The only test that's left is the final exam. Now uh, I've posted grades for uh, for most of the projects. There may be a few I've missed. So if you if you emailed me uh, a video and you don't see a grade posted for your group or for yourself, uh, then let me know. Now there are a few people who did not participate in their group. Uh, had one group which divided into two parts, uh, two people for one part, three people for the other part, and then one person still didn't participate in the group somehow. I don't know. Anyway, it was amazing. But um, so if you if you didn't participate in your group, um, then you got a zero. Now I, I I will let you still go back and do the entire thing, record your own video, uh, and post it, and I'll give you credit. And I know there's one group where one of the uh, the person who didn't participate is going to get some help and uh, we'll get their video done and that'll be fine. So I'm still willing to let you uh, post a video and get credit, but you need to get it done ASAP because I, I don't, we don't want to drag this on so that you uh, are distracted uh, with the third part of the course. All right, so today we're going to start uh, Unit 12. Now this really begins the third part of the course. and. Um, Let's see. And homework nine is is going to be due on the sixth. That's Friday, I think. So make sure you're working on homework nine and getting it ready to be turned in. Um, okay. Now, uh, so so we've covered the, sort of the basic difference between analog and digital. We've talked about codes. We've talked about base uh, base and we talked about number systems with different bases. We've talked about converting from one number system to another. We've talked about uh, a little bit of binary math. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> and we've talked about codes, uh, codes that are fault, that are error correcting, codes that are computable, codes that aren't, codes that are um, gray codes. Um, We've talked about a number of different things. We've talked about fonts, the difference between ASCII representations for letters and numbers, and a font that actually can print out a number or a letter or a symbol. Um, so hopefully uh, we covered that, uh, and we covered the basics of Boolean algebra, uh, all the theorems, and uh, we covered how to use uh, Boolean algebra to manipulate logic expressions. We covered how logic expressions are uh, are basically a uh, a representation of actual uh, a network of gates, and we've talked about how any logic expression can implement can be implemented with a two-layer network, and that there are eight different types of two-layer network if we restrict ourselves to AND, OR, NAND, NOR, and inverters, and um, and of those eight uh, that uh, that of those eight, there's really four that we're really interested in. That's the uh, SOP, POS. Nan, Nan, and Nor, Nor types. Uh, the other ones, I guess, are out there. They probably have been used some, but they're they're just not really that that prominent. Um, <clears throat> so you've done your project. You've learned how to uh, how to share terms between truth tables for different outputs using the same set of input variables. You've learned how to switch it from either SOP to uh, Nan, Nan, or from POS to Nor, Nor. Uh, <clears throat> so, so hopefully you've learned a lot, and you're pretty comfortable taking a truth table and uh, expressing it as a combinational design, where you have some number of inputs, uh, some number of outputs, and a switching network 
that only depends on the current level of the impulse. But now we're going to look at the part, the third part, which is really what most real world digital designs involve, and that's state machines. And a state machine basically uh, is significantly different from a combinational design because a state machine has uh, the outputs depend not just on the current inputs, but on some previous history of past inputs. Now that previous history might be extensive. You might have a state machine with uh, hundreds of different states. Or you might have a state machine with just a few states where just a little bit of information about prior inputs is required. Uh, but either way, these, these are state machines. Now, usually a state machine is just like our combinational design. It has some number of inputs, some number of outputs, and then a network. But the network has an additional feature, and the, uh, the additional feature is that there's some history built into that network. That history knows what state the network is currently in. And, and you create logic that allows it to switch, depending on the new inputs, to the next correct state. And there may be only a few states, there may be a lot of states. Uh, that's a sequential design. Now, we're going to start with a sequential design that basically has no inputs. It just has a, and almost all these designs have clocks, by the way. It just has a clock, so I guess you could call that an input. And every time the clock ticks, it's going to change state. And it's going to have some number of defined states. And what we're going to do is we're going to initially design uh, a counter that counts from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then back to 0. Uh, and th then after we finish with that, then we're going to design a counter that doesn't count a a, a, a a, uh, an ordered sequence, it counts a, a non-sequential sequence. So it might count 2, 7, 3, 4, F, A, D, for instance, or whatever. And then back to the beginning. Uh, so we'll show how to design that. Now, probably many of you, if I gave you a box of parts, you could struggle and work at it, and you could probably eventually get it to count uh, in a binary counter, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to whatever, however many bits you have, and then start over. You could probably get that done. But I, I would challenge that without learning the techniques we're going to talk about right now, I doubt that you would be able to do uh, an arbitrary count sequence in any reasonable amount of time. You probably would struggle greatly doing that because it's not it's not entirely obvious how that would how that should go, and uh, unless you know these techniques, you really would have trouble. So I really I I find this lecture kind of exciting because it's really going to give you uh, tools to do some things you couldn't do before, and uh, and all in about 40 minutes. So here we go. So I'll shrink myself a little bit here. Uh, Something like that, pop up here. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna talk about well register transfers. I don't know. We're just gonna throw this in. Uh, we're gonna talk about design of binary counters and how to use uh, a counter using a non-continuous sequence versus this continuous counter. And we'll do that with uh, several different uh, several different. Uh, uh, flip-flop types. We're going to initially do it with T flip-flops. Uh, this is about the last time we're ever going to use T's for anything. And then we'll show if we did it with SR's, JK's, and D's how that would look. And it's, it'll be kind of interesting. Um, we'll talk a little bit about shift registers and kind of kind of how you should think about your flip-flop input equations. Okay, so here's a register. Now notice that a register is just a bunch of flip-flops. Uh, we, we have, in this case, these flip-flops have a set and a reset. Notice these reset, the set is an active low. The reset is an active low because of the bubbles. And the clock uh, is a falling edge clock, but it's a D flip-flop. And it has a Q and a Q and a Q not outputs. Notice that uh, these active sets are all pulled high, which means they're inactive. So we hook them up to, to <clears throat> the positive voltage through a resistor. That's either 5 or 3.3 or 1.8 volts, something like that. And and we use maybe a 10K ohm resistor to, 
uh, 10 kilo ohms. Uh, so that it pulls very, very little current, but, it, but it's able to keep this at a high so that this set is inactive. Since the set's inactive, it exerts no influence on the flip-flop at this point. But if you made this low, it would force the flip-flop to a set condition. And notice we also do the same with the reset. Now here we tied them all together and then through a resistor pulled them high, so made them inactive as well. So the set and the reset are inactive, not working. So now the clock, every time we get a falling edge, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take D and put it into the flip-flop. Notice that the the, the uh, we also bring these outputs out. So the, the output from this one is Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. And uh, we obviously have these D inputs down here, which we would put in, say, four bits. And when the clock ticked, those would be latched into these flip-flops. And they'd be available then to these Q outputs. And that's basically how, how registers work. Now, this is a four-bit register. Most of our microprocessors have, at a minimum, an eight-bit register. And many of them now uh, use 16, and many of them are now 32-bit devices with it with every location being a 32-bit re register, essentially. Okay, so that's how a register works. We'll talk a little bit more about this as we go on. Uh, when we want to have, you can imagine, let's say we had a register here. Now, this just shows one flip-flop, but, but imagine that we had, say, 16 flip-flops. And here we have 16 flip-flops, and we had 16 lines, each flip-flop connected to a different line. And notice we have these tri-state buffers connecting the output of the flip-flop to our bus. Now, if these, if we had flip-flop, if we had register A all ones and register B all zeros, and we connected them both to the 16 lines of the bus, we would basically be shorting out all of our flip-flops, which would probably damage something and cause lots of problems, draw, draw fairly heavy currents and, and not be a, a good thing for our electronics. So we obviously don't want to do that. So what we do is, we, in order to connect multiple things to the same bus, we have tri-state buffers hooked up here so that we can disable this tri-state buffer and it cause the output of the buffer to be high Z, or we, I like to call high Z disconnected. So it's basically a very high impedance connection so that it really does not uh, exert any influence on the bus. Now when you, on, when you on the other hand, make the, uh, make the control line, in this case it's active high, when you make it active, then that does cause the, the input of the buffer to connect to the output, and then that's going to drive this, this buffer, uh, this bus, rather. Whereas you wouldn't ever want these both uh, active at the same time, so we achieve that by putting an inverter here, and so the enable, if it's high, is going gonna, is gonna to turn on this tri-state buffer, but may put this one in high Z state, and if it's low, it's going to put this one in high, in, this is going to turn this one on, and put this one in high Z state. So that's why we, we only ever connect one of these to the bus at the same time. Now in truth, it would have to be a little more complicated than that, because we'd probably also have this bus connected to a microprocessor someplace. So we, so what we really want is individual control lines, and we just want to make sure our logic never allowed both of them to be uh, uh, high at the same time, uh, which would be active. Okay, so we've looked at four uh, flip-flop types, the RS latch, T flip-flops, JK, and D. Now remember, the JK is really the basic building block, and normally JKs are, are, are implemented as Ds. It's really rare we use them as Ts. The only place where that might show up is in counters. And you really can't go out and buy a T flip-flop. You can go out and buy Ds, JKs, and RSs, but you can't buy a T uh, because we just make them out of JKs or they're just part of a counter. Uh, the most common flip-flop these days is probably the D, and that's because it, it reduces the amount of wires, which in our integrated circuits is really what we're interested in usually. JKs would often result in the least amount of logic, but it, it does increase the wiring and so there are times when we really want to avoid them just to keep the just to reduce the wiring. And then RSs still show up, and they're usually where we have they talk about narrow width clock systems, in other words, high speed clocks. So when you really want to uh, have a, a fastest response as you can, we'll we'll use an RS clock latch. 
because it's, it's, it doesn't have the master-slave stage and it's much faster. Okay, but it has issues because it doesn't really have an edge per se. All right, so here are the, here are the, uh, the little equations to show you if you're trying to design something with these flip-flops, this is kind of what you have to know. This looks like, oh my gosh, I have to memorize all this. Well, it's not that difficult. All you have to do is remember that, that the SR, uh, you have this restriction that they can't be one at the same time, so that takes away some of our don't cares. But remember, S sets and R clears. If they're both zero, it holds, if they're, and they can't be both one. Whereas in JK, uh, J sets, K clears, if they're both one, it toggles. If they're both zero, it holds. And T, it's either going to toggle or it's going to hold. And D, whatever D is, that's what the output's going to be. And it turns out, you can think about the T and the D. The D is like the middle two rows of the JK, and the T is like the top and the bottom rows of this JK. Because the T either holds or toggles, whereas the JK, uh, whereas the D, if uh, if it's if uh, if J is one, well, say if D is one, it's going to set, and if D is zero, it's going to clear. That's the way the J, that's the way the D works. All right. So here's our three bit counter. So now the way the book did this, uh, I I find really irritating, uh, because the, the the book didn't want to in, introduce a clock. The book uh, wanted to introduce a uh, what they called a pulse, which is really a clock. And so they added the pulse as a signal in the, all the circuitry. So I'm going to ignore that because I, I think that's confusing. And that's the one and only time the book ever used this pulse thing. They never did it again. Uh, so it was kind of like training wheels on your first uh, sequential design. But it's a lot easier just to use the clock and, and not try and pretend there's not a clock. All right. So... So I'm gonna, so, so don't worry about the pulse thing. We're gonna work around it, but I'm gonna sort of include it and sort of not here. Okay, so what we have is three flip flops, and they're th they're T flip flops in this particular case. That's also kind of irritating because we're not gonna, we're really generally not ever gonna use T's to do designs, but we use it to, for this one because it is a counter. We do sometimes use T's for counters. So okay, all right. So we have three flip-flops, and their flip-flop names are A, B, and C, although the C got left out over here. Now, these flip-flops have an input, and the input is the T input. Remember, if the T input is a 1, on each clock edge, it's going to toggle. It's going to go, if, it's, if it is 1, it'll go to 0. If it is 0, it'll go to 1. That's what we call toggling. Whenever you flip your state, that's called a toggle. Okay, so, so when T is 1, they're going to toggle. And when T is zero, they're going to hold. And we have a TA input, we have a TB input, and we have a TC input. And so those are those are how we're going to change, control the flip flops. The clock is just going to be automatic. It's just going to be ticking away uh, regardless. But we have to make sure that our T inputs are set up so that each time the clock ticks, we have we have the correct T input so that we increment our count by one. Now you know from your projects, we start off 0, 0, 0, and then the next one is 0, 0, 1, and then the next one, A stays 0, but B goes to 1, but C goes back to 0. And then the next one, then we have 0, 1, 1, and then we have 1, 0, 0, and then 1, 0, 1, and then 1, 1, 0, and finally 1, 1, 1, and then the next tick, 0, 0, 0 again. We're back to where we started. And so we're going to tick through eight different numbers 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 and then back to 0 so that that's basically going to be how this counter works now uh, we're going to we're going to do our sequential designs using a uh, a truth table okay and <coughs> so here's our truth table now when we do sequential designs we we don't call them truth tables anymore we call them uh, we call it a state table instead. Now the reason for this is that it's it's not exactly a truth table. It's got an, some extra columns and it's kind of a little different. So how is it different? Well, it's different in the sense that we have just like a truth table, we have our, our present state and we 
put them in binary order here. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then, you know, that's all our states. Then we have, uh, yeah, and I, I think I told you this counter was going to count to to 15, or, but it's only a 3-bit counter, so it's only going to count to 7. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So eight, 8 different numbers. All right. So anyway, so our because we're always counting by 1, if we're in our present state of 0, then our next state would be 1. And if we're in state 1, our next state would be 2. And if we're in 2, our next state would be 3. And so forth. And finally, if we're in state 7, our next state would be, you guessed it, 0, because we're going to start the process all over. So because this, this particular problem has no input other than the clock, we, we always go to the same next state from any given state. So from zero, we all go, always go to state one. From state one, we always go to state two, and so forth. From state seven, we always go back to zero. Now, to make this happen, what do we need for our flip-flop inputs? Because we're going to build an, a, a, a switching network and connect to each of our flip-flops to make them work correctly. And what do we have to cr have? Well... So we create these three columns. These are some additional columns, which mean, which is why this isn't really a truth table. It's really a state table, okay? And and uh, and our three additional columns are the three inputs to our three T flip flops: T A, T B, and T C. And these three inputs have to be the correct thing to make the present state correctly change to the next state on the next clock edge. Now. If we want A to be at zero here and to also be at zero here, then flip-flop A, flip-flop A that's a T flip-flop, has to have a T A input of zero because it's going to hold. And remember, for a T flip-flop, if our input, if our T input is zero, it'll hold. But if we want it to change or toggle, flip from its current state to it to the opposite state then we have to make that input a 1. Now, look here. A stays the same, B stays the same, but C flips from 0 to 1. So our TA inputs are 0 to hold at 0, 0 to hold at 0, and 1 to toggle from 0 to 1. Now, now we're in state 1, and we want to go to state 2. So our A flip-flop doesn't change, right? It stays 0. But look, our B flip-flop now toggles from 0 to 1, and our C flip-flop toggles from 1 to 0. Now, it doesn't matter whether you toggle from 0 to 1 or whether you toggle from 1 to 0. All you have to do is make the T, the T input a 1, and it will change either way. It'll always take whatever state it's in and flip it to the opposite state. That's how T flip-flop works. That's what the word toggle means, okay? So, so our, for this transition, our TA input should still be 0, our T input, our TB should be 1 this time, and our TC should also be 1. Now notice, if you look at this, the T goes from 1 to 0 to 1 to 0 to 1 to 0 to 1 to 0. So every time the T is a 1, the TC, the T input for flip-flop C is a 1. But the T input, uh, it holds, and then it toggles. 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 And the TA input holds, 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 toggles, holds, 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 toggles. And that's because it's 0, 0, 0, 0, but here it switches to a 1. And then it holds it 1, 1, 1, 1, and here it switches back to 0. So, so it all makes perfect sense. We have now just what we need for our T inputs. Now, how do we implement this in hardware? Well, this is really the interesting thing. The first thing we, we want to do is we want we want to simplify our hardware too. We could just implement it directly, but it, it we'd have a lot more gates than we really need because we can probably simplify this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create uh, a K map using these these T columns. Now the book also does this next state K map, and it it describes how you can do the T's even from the next state maps, like cutting them in half and doing this and that. And that's really it's kind of goofy and stupid. Don't just ignore that. Uh, because we're really not going to use uh, design with T's very often anyway. 
Uh, this is about the only time. There may be some homework problems, but I'm never going to ask you a question on a test to design with T flip-flops. I'm going to use D's, uh, or maybe a JK, but never a T. So, and in this case, what I want you to do then is uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to use these columns to, to, to actually generate the K maps. So ignore the fact that it generates K maps for the next state. Because we're going to do that whenever we whenever we use D flip flops to uh, build our circuit, we would we would then design it using the next eight columns, and we wouldn't need these extra columns. But for the T, we do need these extra columns, and we really don't need these next eight columns. So even though the book does the K maps for the next states and kind of plays games with them, just ignore that. All right. So here 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 are the T inputs. So notice. There's really no point in doing a K map for TC because it's all all ones, which means that the solution is just the constant one. Or we connect the TC input high and we leave it high, which means it toggles every single clock tick, and that's what happens: one zero one zero one zero one zero. It's always toggling. But the TB and the TC are a little different. We have to put some stuff in for them. So let's see what we have to put in. All right. So here now, how do we get? The information from these columns into a K map. Well, the first question you should ask: What are the variables for this K map? And the variables are just A, B, C. Now, if we had an input, we would also include that as one of our independent variables. But we don't have any inputs, so our our only independent variables are our current state of our flip flops. And that's all we have. So our K maps are going to be three variable maps. And we're going to populate them just like uh, we do off a truth table. We're going to do one, one, flip the bottom two rows. So one, 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 and one, 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 one. Now watch. Oh, well, not the ones, but the zeros. So, so let's look at the TB map, okay? So for the TB map, we do, uh, and if you remember, it's zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. So it's really easy. No problem. So it's 0, 1, flip the rows, 0 down here, 1 there. And then 0, 1, 0, 1. So that gives us these four ones. We loop them with a single loop, and that's going to give us C. So our TB flip-flop, all we have to do is connect the output from our, uh, from our C flip-flop, and that will drive this correctly. And then what about A? Well, A has to have a gate, and it it's an AND gate with B and C because uh, if you look at the if you look at the T, it's zero 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 one zero 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 one. Okay, so zero zero, flip the rows zero one zero zero flip the rows zero one. So you have these two ones right here, and A drops out, and so you're just left with B C. So our T A input is just B C. And that's perfect. All right. So uh, if you do, if you look at the book, you'll see they fold the pulse in, which gets kind of confusing. So just ignore that. Okay. So here, here's here it is with the pulse. Forget the pulse. Here it is with with you have a clock and and forget the pulse thing. And that's really what it would be. The the pulse is a, is dumb here. Okay. Um, okay. So. So we have just the C output going into flip-flop, B's input, TB, and we have the B output from B ended with the output from C going into flip-flop A, TA, the TA input. And then we have these three outputs. Now, again, this counter really doesn't even have any outputs. It's just the state of the flip-flops. Now, you could use these outputs to drive an LED so you could see what the states were or something like that. Uh, but... There's really no output per se. It's just what the states of the flip-flop are. All right, so that, that, that then is the logic to create a sequential counter. That's going to count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on. With every clock tick, it's going to go up one more till it gets to 7, and then it's going to start back at 0. All right, and here's our state graph. Now, state graphs basically show the series of states. We start with all zeros. And we go to 1, and then to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 
7, and then back to 0. So that's our state graph. Now later, our state graphs will get more complicated because when we have an input, we have choices about wh what state we go to next. But when there's no inputs, there's no choices. We always, we can only go, we only have one choice. All right, so what are we gonna do now if we have a count sequence that's not sequential? Aha, that's gonna take a little more work. Okay, so here's this, this uh, so we're gonna do this not sequential counter. Here are the steps we're gonna use, and these steps are pretty generic for most of our, uh, our sequential designs we're gonna do. First, we're gonna draw a state graph. Now, later on, I'm gonna introduce the concept of an SM chart, and and so you could start with an SM chart too. They're very similar, but the SM chart has some advantages and we'll talk about those. Um, and uh, as I've, over the years as I've taught this course, uh, I've become more and more uh, impressed with the SM charts because you can actually write the equations directly from the SM charts and you don't have to go through uh, state tables and, and K maps and all that. Uh, so it's, it's actually pretty cool, but we'll get to that. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is do this state graph or maybe SM chart. We're only gonna include, uh, in this case, because we're doing this non-continuous sequence, we're, we're just gonna include the desired uh, sequences. And then we're gonna arrange them in whatever proper order that, that, that was specified by the problem. And, and that's gonna be our state graph. Then we're gonna do our state table really uh, i said truth table here it's really a state table we're going to we're going to do all the present inputs and now even though we don't only have we don't have let's say if we have three flip-flops we're not going to have necessarily eight states we, uh, we may only have five and some that are missing but in our state table we're going to include all the possible rows so that we can have some don't cares and that's going to make it uh easier to simplify uh, our, our equations when we're all done. Now that is one advantage that going through the truth tables and the k-maps, uh, uh, the state tables and the k-maps has over, uh, uh, say, our uh, SM chart. With our SM chart, we don't necessarily get to use the uh, don't cares. All right. So then we're going to plot. We're going to plot the uh, the k-maps from our state table, and uh, and we're going to draw the circuit. Now in this case, we're going to use T input, we're going to use T flip-flops again. Uh, but this is about the last time we're going to do T's, so don't get fixated on T's. Normally we're going to use D's and it's going to be a little simpler because we don't have to have the extra columns for the T inputs because the D inputs and the next state columns are identical. All right, all right, so here's our state graph. Now here's our sequence. 0, 1, uh, 4, 7, 2, 3. 0, 4, 7, 2, 3, 0, 4, 7, 2, 3. We're missing 1, 5, and 6. Those are not in the sequence. All right, so let's do our state table. Now notice I still have row 1, 5, and 6, even though we're not going to use these. But I put them in because then we can have don't cares here. I should have put X's, not dashes. Now, but for the ones that we do care about, so we have present state zero zero zero. Okay, so what is our desired next state? Well, we have to look at our state graph. From zero, we're going to four. Okay, so now in our next state column, we don't put one like we did when we did a sequential counter. We put four because if you're in state zero, when the clock ticks, what state do you want to go to? You want to go from zero to four. So we put four right there. And four happens to be coded 1 for A, 0 for B, and 0 for C. That's 4. Now, what would we have to have for our T inputs to, to make this happen? Well, we would hold B and C, and we'd toggle A. So we put a 1, 0, and a 0 for our T, A, T, B, and T, C inputs. Then we have a don't care. And then, now, what about state... Uh, so this is 0, 1. What about state 2? Well, we have to look at our, st our state graph. 2 is down here. In two, we're going to three, okay? So for, we're in two, next desired state is three. And here, what changes? Well, B is one, and it's one here, so it doesn't change. A is zero and zero, so it doesn't change. But C toggles, so we put a one for C there, okay? 
And that's the correct TC input, and we have the correct TA and TB inputs for this transition. All right, now we have three. What's the desired next state for three? Well, three is here, and it goes to zero. All right, so from three, the desired next state is zero. And what does that mean for our T inputs? Well, zero holds, uh, A holds, but B and C toggle. So it should be zero, one, one. And then, now we have four. Where does four go? Well, four goes to seven. You can see that right here. Four goes to seven. So, so we put uh, we put four here and seven here. And so now what, what do we do for A? Well, one stays the same, but B and C toggle. So it's zero, one, one, which happens to be the same here. Now notice we can have exactly the same T inputs, but since we're starting at a different state, we'll, we're going to get to a different state. So it's fine. And then we have two don't cares. And then finally we have seven. And sorry, it went the wrong way. Seven goes to, to two. So then from seven we go to two. So one and C toggle, but B holds. So zero, so one, zero, one. All right. So the, so that now we have all this information. Now we're just going to put this in three K maps for TA, TB, and TC. These are the next state maps. Uh, but here are T maps. Now the next state maps. This is what we would use for D. And notice the book has this thing about. Uh, notice that T equals one whenever Q plus doesn't equal Q. Blah blah blah. It, don't worry about this. Just do it like this. All right. So, so it turns out these these equations are a little more complicated. TC is A or B, TB is A prime C or A or AB prime, and TA is A prime B prime plus AB. So three gates here, three gates here, one gate here. All right. In here are the solutions. And yeah, there they are. Okay. All right, and here's our circuit. Seven gates and a clock. And this circuit then, if the clock ticks, it would count all the way through. Now, now, if we let's say we had a customer that needed us to have a to have a count, a clock that actually counted these numbers for some reason. And they wanted to incorporate that in some other device. This would do it. This would do it just fine. But there is a question. What about what happens when we power it up? When we power this device up, what state is it going to power up in? Well, the answer is you don't know. You don't know. And the problem is, it could power up in one of our three. Uh, states that 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 we we say will never happen right and okay that's fine but what if it powers up in 101 and then on the next tick it goes to 110 and then on the next tick it goes back to 101 and on the next tick it goes back to 110 and it just never never gets into the proper sequence what if that happens so that's that's potentially a problem right we should look at this because we might want to take our don't care slightly differently and see if we can fix this. Or, <coughs> better yet, maybe add some more gates so that, so that no matter where it powers up, it's always going to be in a proper sequence after the first clock tick or so. So how do we sort this out? How do we evaluate this? Well, what we do, and I'm, I'm not going to take the time to go through it in detail right now, but the way this would actually work, you would take the circuit here, and you would go ahead and set in the flip-flop. So for 101, we'd let's see, we'd set in 101. And 101, okay? Then we'd look and see what all these values would be down here and what the TC, TA, and TB inputs would be. And if you do that, what you'll find, because I did this already, sorry, you'll find that if you do start in 101, the next eight, uh, well, if you start in 0, 0, 001, you go here. If you start in 110, you go here. And if you start in 101, first you go to 110, and then you go here. So what that really tells you is that you're going to have to tell your customer that when you power this up, unless you 
want me to spend a little more money and design some additional circuitry, it could power up into any state. And if it does power up into this 101 state, you're going to have to wait for one clock tick, two clock ticks, before you're going to be in one of your desired sequences. If it powers up into 110 or 001, you only have to wait one clock tick. So basically, when you power this up, you must wait two ticks of the clock so before you can be assured that you're in one of the proper count sequences. Now, is that acceptable? And the customer might say, oh my God, no, I can't tolerate that. Well, okay, now you're going to have to have some initialization circuitry. You're, and, and that's actually complicated to do. Uh, it's doable, but it would be complicated and you're going to have to do it. And, and then you, once you get it initialized, then you're going to have to let the initialization circuitry sort of stop working and then let the, the rest of your count circuitry take over. So it's a little tricky. You're going to have to mess with some stuff. If he says, yeah, yeah, that's okay. I can wait two clock cycles before I'm using my counter. I, I, I'm going to turn the counter on first and then I'll, I'll, I'll wait a minute or so and then I'll turn on uh, the downstream device that this is going to drive. Okay, fine. That's great. As long as the customer understands that's how it is. But, of course, we needed to understand because if for some reason maybe 101 would go to 110, would go to 001, which go go back to 101, and then we'd get in this weird sequence and it would never get into the correct sequence. That would be a game changer. Now, of course, you could say, well, if you turn on your device and it doesn't work, just turn it off and turn it back on. You'll probably be okay. Oh, great. That sounds like you made a real crappy piece of equipment to me. <laughs> you know, uh, we've all had devices where we've had to do that, haven't we? Well, guess what? That's probably why, because it powered up in a goofy state and they never really arranged for it to get itself straightened out. Uh, and, and you can see this all the time with different devices. Sometimes you turn them on and, you know, not, 99 times out of 100, you turn them on, they work fine. But one time you turn it on, it doesn't work. Why is that? Probably something very similar to this. There was a, a, a condition where in the power-up mode, if it just powered up just incorrectly enough, it would get stuck in a, in a bad state. <clears throat> okay, so now what we're going to do, uh, we're going to, we're going to, so, uh, let's see. Yeah, so we've already, we've already done, so we did the T. Now what I want you to see here is, note, note we had seven gates for the T's, okay? Now we're going to do this with all the other flip-flop types. We're going to do it with SR's. It's the same thing, only we have a different, we have to use this little table here. If we're in zero and we go on to go to zero, then S has to be zero, R is a don't care. If we're, if we're in zero and we want to go to one, S has to be a one and R must be zero. If we're in one and want to go to zero, S is zero and R must be one. And if we're going to stay at one, S can be a don't care, but R must be zero. Okay, so we do have some don't cares here in addition to our undesired states. So we got a few don't cares. So Notice that we have to have not one, but two columns for each one of our flip-flops. So now we've got six columns over here. Two for our A flip-flop, S and R. Two for S, B, and R, B. And two for S, C, and R, C. So a lot more, lot more wiring. Now let's see what, is, what it turns out in terms of gate counts. So we're going to have six, six uh, flip-flops. Uh, sorry, six K-maps and... Uh, here are the next states. The next states would have been exactly the same as our previous ones. Uh, but here's our six flip-flops. And <clears throat> notice our equations are pretty simple, which is nice. Here, I'll get rid of this. The only one that's complicated is the uh, S S C, And it's a C prime anded with the, the quantity A ordered with B. All right, well, anyway, yeah, I, yeah, what I didn't, I didn't loop these two, but those have to be looped too, right? Uh, I'm a little confused how I got this, actually, C prime. Oh, I guess I, yeah, it, so I had two terms that I factored out to C prime. All right, well, anyway, I simplified it. All right, yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so that's what it looks like. And here's our circuitry. Three gates. Wow, isn't that interesting? Quite a much much less complicated logic, but more wiring. Okay, what about JK? Well, JK's got a lot more don't cares, so probably get a little more simplification. And look at this, two gates. And then what about D's? D's are going to look like this. We just have to use our next state maps here. We don't have to have extra, extra columns. Did I do the extra column? Yeah. Notice on the J, we have a JA and a KA, a JB and a KB, a JC and a KC. So we do have to have six extra columns. But for the B, for the D's, we can just use these. We don't even need any extra columns. All right. So here are the D's. We can use the next eight maps, and here they are. Five gates. So notice, D's five gates, JK two gates, RS three gates, and uh, our T's, uh, where was that T's? Uh, no, sorry, here. Crap. Seven gates. Two, three, five, and seven. So the T's were the worst of all. D's were next, SR were next, or RS were next, and then JK gives the least number of gates. But remember, when you have to, when you have to drive two inputs for each flip-flop, you have more wiring. All right, so, um, okay, I think, yeah, uh, okay, I think I'm going to stop here. And we'll pick we'll pick up with this on uh, Wednesday.